The story, it took a while to piece together uh, because often, you know, with, with my grandfather and grandmother, they didn't talk a lot about Lebanon. So my father and his siblings didn't hear a lot about, you know, the old country when they were growing up because they were assimilating and becoming more American. And so it became the third generation, my generation, with the cousins who started to share more and ask more questions. So I feel like the story got pieced together through myself asking and several cousins, my cousin Paula, who now goes back to Lebanon every summer uh, with her husband Adnan, who's from Lebanon. So, you know, I feel like the story's gotten revived and pieced together. Uh, and my so father's family is from Lebanon. My great-grandmother Francina came over by boat and brought her son, Thomas, my grandfather. Uh, when he was about 17 or 18, and they settled in Lowell, Massachusetts, and started working in the textile mills, which was very common at the time for Syrian and Lebanese immigrants. They saved enough money to start a neighborhood market where they had a lot of ingredients to make traditional Lebanese and Syrian food. They had that store for about 30 years. My grandfather Thomas worked seven days a week, pretty much in the store, the children all did. And when he was in his late 20s, uh, he uh, wasn't excited about getting married, but Francina decided it was time, so she sent word to the village where they're from, uh, Haush al Kanabi, which is on the Syrian border, and asked for a cousin to be sent over. Um, and Mary, or otherwise known as Jenny, and she was about 16 at the time, um, and she brought over uh, grapevine clippings and she tied them in a cloth and she brought them on the boat with her. And when they got married, they settled into a house on Adams Street and she planted the vine in the front yard. Uh, they raised five children. My father, Raymond, uh, was the youngest of five. And um, most of the children worked in the mills uh, for a time and then also helped out at the market as they were growing up. And my father remembers the grapevine growing so big that he was able to pick leaves right through the kitchen window to help my mother when she was, or my grandmother when she was making uh, stuffed grape leaves. And my cousin Tom, my uncle Frank's oldest son, when he was little remembers playing with toy soldiers. He used to set them up right under the grapevine in the front of the house and hide under the grapevine and play with the toy soldiers. So the grapevine had a really big presence uh, at Adam Street and the memory of the grapevine and the taste of the stuffed grape leaves is really carried down through my family. So my father's sister, Aunt Julie, uh, carried on the tradition of making the grape leaves. When they sold the Adam Street house, uh, they transplanted the grapevine to Chelmsford, Massachusetts, where she was living with my uncle George uh, and my grandfather. My grandmother had died at that point. Uh, so she carried on the tradition and I grew up going to their house on Sundays, eating stuffed grape leaves along with kibbe and other Lebanese dishes. Uh, then uh, when my aunt and uncle and grandfather passed away, my cousin John, one of my uncle Frank's uh, other sons, uh, dug up the grapevine and brought it to his house in New Hampshire, shared some clippings with uh, Tom, who was a little boy with the toy soldiers. And they both uh, started growing the grapevine in their backyards and also picking the leaves and making the stuffed grape leaves. Uh, for some reason, the grapevine never produces grapes. It only produces the leaves. But every year, everyone said it never fails. It produces these perfect leaves, just perfect for making the stuffed grape leaves. Uh, and um, my cousin Tom feels like it's like Aunt Julie's spirit really is living in the grapevine and that connects to our grandmother and then our great grandmother, et cetera. She, she actually, um, my Aunt Julie would, um, she would actually make the grape leaves and cabbage leaves and when we would come to the house on Sundays, they'd be in a big pot just simmering. And again, that scent, that smell is very potent for me also. He calls the grapevine now Aunt Julie's vine. That's sort of the name he's given it and feels like again, her spirit is sort of watching over his house now that he's keeping the vine nicely. Well, food is such a cultural carrier. And in my family, food means love as it does in, I think, many cultures. So that was always our expression of love. You know, not always very verbal about love, but very much about sharing food, coming together for meals, 
taking food home with you, too much food, <laughs> putting food in your car as you went home. That was always, I felt like the expression of love that I felt from my family. Mm -hmm.